good morning. I'm excited to be here with y'all. It's been over, oh, I'm forgetting already. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> it's been over two years since I've spoken publicly. So this is both exciting and then there's that 10% of me that has this little bit of nervous energy. Uh, so it's a good combination and I'm excited to channel it and to share a bit about myself with you all this morning and to share on the topic. I do have some slides, but we'll see what the wind decides to do with them. Um, all right. So we're going to actually start out with some breathing this morning, which is true to what I do with Right to Heal. Every single one of my workshops starts with some breathing. And this is a little bit of cheating for me because for public speakers, if we remember to take a deep breath, it all seems a lot less scary. So this is for both of us. Then I'll get a bit vulnerable and I'll share some of my personal story and I'll talk a bit about how I think that ties to the, the theme, Kismet. And then I'll share a bit about Right to Heal, which is my business um, that I started and that has flowered due to the 1909 accelerator. So it's all coming, it's all like aligned in the stars. It's already happening. Um, and then I'll have some space to answer any questions that you might have. So that's our plan for today. This is actually one of my favorite quotes. The breath is a door. Without the breath, what is there? It's where you and I and everyone else began. It's where all life begins. And so we're going to start the presentation with the breath. What I'd like you to do in this moment is if you're comfortable and feel safe, and I feel pretty safe in here, but safety is different for all of us, I invite you to just close your eyes. In this moment, begin to settle into your body, whatever that means for you. For me, that means feeling the ground, hearing the wind, acknowledging her, honoring her, and also relaxing my shoulders. In this moment, I invite you to take in a deep inhale in through the nose and then just release it however it feels good for you, allowing your shoulders to relax, allowing your forehead to relax, the sides of your face. In this moment, begin to honor yourself for all of the steps you took to arrive here this morning with all of us. Begin to honor yourself for the support you're offering to me as your speaker and to your beautiful community. On this next inhale, we're gonna allow our bellies to fill in with that good oxygen. Allow them to expand out as we inhale in that good air. We're gonna exhale and imagine our belly button wants to touch our spine. In this moment, do it at your own pace. Slow, smooth inhale in through the nose. Exhale out of the nose. Make it long, make it smooth. On this inhale, fill the air, feel the air, fill your belly, the sides of your ribs, all the way up to your chest, and release it. And when you're ready, I invite you to meet me back here with your eyes open. <sighs> Thank you for that. If at any point during my presentation you feel the need to take in a deep inhale, 
I encourage you to, to, encourage you to do it. It's something I'll be doing. And I'll share some of my personal story. And there are bits of it that can be intense. And so this breath is your tool to use throughout the, work, throughout the event if you feel like you're in need of a breath. So I want you to imagine me 20 years ago, nine years old, 29, believe it or not, <laughs> and weighing about half of what I do now, maybe a foot shorter. I had much longer hair. My mom would twist them, and the braids would fall on my shoulder blades, sometimes below my shoulder blades. She'd often get me these little dresses that were custom made, and they'd have cute bows that tied in the back. Sometimes I'd get even cool shoes with glitter on them. I was a very joyful kid. And I'm actually very comfortable barefoot, and I've always been that way. And so I spent a lot of my time running around, rough at housing with my brothers, rough housing with the boys, and getting told to act like a lady. It's likely where the whole feminist thing came from. Because <laughs> I think us ladies can be whatever the heck we want to be. But along with that joy I experienced as a kid, I also experienced four ACEs. That's four adverse childhood experiences. And I'll tell you a little bit about those. So in this school picture, here I am smiling among my friends, and I was quite happy as a kid, a bit of a perfectionist, always striving to get those straight A's. But I likely went home with that smile, but I was met with a parent who often swore at and humiliated my brothers and me for small mistakes. This same parent would often give us silent treatments that went on for days, and as a kid, those days could feel much longer. They could feel like weeks at times. And as we would apologize for those mistakes, they were met with more humiliation. This same parent also dealt with depressive episodes that would go on for what felt like weeks, months, that often put us in danger. On top of that, I am one in four. That's one in four people who experience childhood sexual trauma. So at nine years old, by the time this picture was taken, I had already experienced all of these things. On top of that, the year before, at eight years old, my family left my home country of La Vallée de Jacmel to move to the United States. We moved to Spring Valley, New York, on political asylum. My dad was a politician. I often like to say he was on the good side, and he was. Uh, politics in Haiti is a bit tough. And due to his involvement, we were faced with threats of violence and possibly death. So we moved to the US on political asylum. I share that because as I reflected on this theme, I thought about the joy I experienced as a kid. I thought about how intuitive I was. I thought about how the stars were aligned for me to experience good and to be a source of good fortune for others in my life. But I also thought about this stuff. And even as I shared this presentation with Tiffany, who's actually, uh, who actually has spoken here before at Creative Mornings, I felt a bit of shyness about sharing my story. And she reminded me that that is also part of what makes me who I am. And the reason that I think I've been afraid to share that aspect of my story is because I'm often met with this idea that everything happens for a reason. And it kept coming up for me, too, as I meditated on this idea of kismet. Does everything happen for a reason? And I found myself thinking, how can the shitty, harmful things that we endure happen for a reason? How can a child at nine years old having to leave their home country, having to, the person, one of the people who are, who's meant to love them, be a source of fear and shame? How can that happen for a reason? And the more that I thought about it, the more I landed on this idea that the stars align for good, and I didn't do it myself, it's the theme, but I found comfort in that. And I actually kind of see a difference between the concept that everything happens for a reason and that the stars align for good. Because I don't think there was a reason that I grew up with this level of harm and violence in my life. But as I look back, I can see that there are sprinkles of good that align to bring me to where I am right here this morning with all of you who have all of your own journeys that brought you here for a reason. And so I find comfort in this idea that throughout my life, no matter what I was enduring, no matter what suffering I faced or suffering that I was conquering, that there was always something bigger for me. And as I thought about this, I even one of the stories that popped up for me 
was I was such an intuitive kid. And I have a great aunt who lost her sister. And as Haitians, when there's a death in the family, we all gather, we stay up all night, we talk about that person, we honor that person, and we drink black coffee with salt. I don't know why, <laughs> uh, but it's a thing we do. And at that time, when my aunt was, was grieving, I went over to her and I said something. I tried to remember what it is I said for the sake of this presentation, and I couldn't. But whatever I said to her was exactly what she needed to hear. So with all of this trauma going on in my life, I was still able to be a source of good fortune for someone else in their moment of need. And the reason I was able to do that is because as I received a message from the stars, from spirit with a big S, I listened and I acted on it. And I realized that this has been a theme for me in my life. And what's been key What's led me to this place where I'm here in front of you this morning having this conversation, what's led me to the point where I've written poetry and shared poetry, what's led me to the point where I had this business idea that I then took to the business accelerator is the fact that I act on those stars. I think most of us are aware that when we look up at the sky, we can see those beautiful stars. If it's cloudy or polluted, like in Los Angeles, the stars might be harder to see. They're still there. But it's our choice whether or not we want to act on them. It's our choice whether or not we want to clear out the stuff that's in the way to see the message. And so one of the things I want to leave you with today is to act on your good fortune. When you sit back and you acknowledge all of the things that you've been through, when you sit back and you acknowledge your own suffering, your own trauma, your own journey, even what's going on in the world today, it might feel like there is no good fortune. There is. Work, there, there are tools that we have at our disposal. For me, those tools are breathing and writing. The breath that we just took this morning helps to calm me, and I also write. And those tools allow me to clear out the path so that I can act, so that I can continue to be a source of good for myself and those in my community. And to talk a little bit more about breathing and writing and the work that I do with Write to Heal, and I, I, can you all see that? It's, I, okay, awesome. So that's a picture of my accelerator cohort uh, that was six months with some awesome local business owners and idea sharers who turned ideas into businesses, and I was one of them. And what I came to realize after the six months of the business accelerator is that breathing and writing are tools for me that allow me to get closer to listening and hearing myself. When I'm able to take a breath, I'm able to kind of relax into my body, relax into my spirit, and really hear what my message, what's, whatever message that the spirit has for me, and that's my belief. And then I'm able to act on those messages. And Write to Heal is a workshop that I created to help people process stress using pen to paper writing and community building like we're doing this morning. And it's a workshop that predominantly serves women like myself, women in their 20s and 30s, who have experienced similar adverse childhood experiences. I didn't design it with that idea. I designed it really to be a healing workshop during the pandemic for folks to come and gather. And 28 people showed up in that gathering space. And the more that I learned that people found a sense of safety and support with me, the more that I continued to research, the more that I continued to dive deep, the more that I continued to heal. So even in being a, a source of support for others, it encouraged me to continue to be a source of support for myself. So I have, when I think back about this idea of everything happening for a reason versus the stars are aligned for me, I see them being a little different. I'm not quite sure if they are. I don't think I have the knowledge of all things to kind of know if everything happens for a reason. I think I'd be kind of arrogant and egotistical if I step in front of you and was like, I have the answers. I don't think I do at all. But the answers that I do have is that when I'm standing in a room, when I'm sharing space with other people, who are acknowledging their trauma, who are willing to heal from their trauma, who are encouraging other people to move beyond suffering, I feel purposed. I feel like this is exactly where I need to be in this moment. And so with Right to Heal, I often hear, flows. you create a sense of safety and support for people. And for a while, I just thought to myself, how? <laughs> I just show up and I'm myself and I do these things. And um, it's something I've actually thought about quite a lot due, due to this presentation and with the accelerator. And I, I believe I create a sense of safety because I've been in so many spaces where I have been unsafe. 
So as I go back and look, I look at the narratives and I look at the patterns and I look at those stars and turn them over and see what they're trying to tell me, I realize that because I experienced violence in my early childhood, I want every single person in this room, when they walk in, to feel fully safe and capable of being who they are fully no matter what. Screw the rules and be what you need to be and who you need to be to access your best self because that's when you can most see what the universe intends for you and that's when you can most clearly act on what the universe intends for you. And so with my workshops, I create a sense of safety and I provide support, I meet folks where they are and I encourage them, I push them along the way. And that's something that I believe I'm able to do because of the experiences I've had. I can't say whether there is a silver lining, but I can say that I've listened and that listening has brought me to this place. And um, so these are some awesome pictures of me hosting Right to Heal throughout the community. One of the most important things to me is that healing is accessible to all of us, um, that we are able to access ourselves fully. And that's because my understanding of trauma has led me to acknowledge that our experiences live with us. They live in our nervous system. We carry them with us everywhere we go. And if you look up um, adverse childhood experiences and folks who've experienced trauma in their early childhood, it changes your brain chemistry. So something that is not a trigger for one of you in this room might be a trigger for another person in this room because of the experiences we had growing up. And that being said, I, I want to make healing accessible to everyone. And so I've had this opportunity to work with Pranu and Rohi's readery. She is a rock star. Um, in making healing free for members of the community who need it. And Pranu pays me to come and host these workshops. I've been able to host Right to Heal um, at the public library here in West Palm Beach, or up in West Palm Beach. And um, that is free for the community as well. But I also host these workshops for folks who are able to pay to come and access healing. And I'm actually really excited that I'm able to provide Right to Heal to businesses as well as non-for-profits to give to their people because I don't believe troubles can be parsed and fragmented. There's this idea that people can leave their troubles at the door and show up and do the work. And I actually don't believe that because I have been that person who was just crying five minutes ago and showed up to a work meeting able to just pretend it's all okay. I don't do that anymore. And I feel really blessed to have opportunities like with Brian where I don't have to fake it. But we're not, we're not able to parse out our experiences and leave our troubles at the door. We all require healing and the feeling, feeling loved and supported. So I feel really blessed to bring Right to Heal to folks in all areas of the community. And I'm nearing the end um, of the presentation. And as I thought to myself, what are the three main takeaways I want folks to walk away from who got up bright and early? Maybe 8 o'clock isn't bright and early for you, but it is for me. <laughs> It was a struggle. Jesse reminded me that I worked hard on this. <laughs> it was worth getting out of bed for. <laughs> um, so this is really early for me, and I really appreciate you being here with me. And the stars are always aligned for your greatest good. Good is an unlimited resource. There's so much of it, just like love. If I love you, I don't, I don't run out of love for you or you or you. There's so much good in this universe. and. It is in our greatest favor. The universe is always acting in our greatest favor. So that's the number one thing I want you to take away from this, that the stars are always aligned for you. There are moments when it's harder to see the good, but you can defog the window using tools in your tool toolbox and you can look again. For me, the tools in my toolbox are to breathe every morning. I remind myself right here in this belly place. I think especially as women, we're taught to like hold it in and wear the extra tighter jeans and we're struggling to breathe throughout our day. Breathe, unbutton your pants, get a bigger size and just breathe. So for me, those are my tools and I encourage you to take those deep inhales and exhales through the belly because a lot of us tend to breathe in our chest and our shoulder area, which can encourage us to feel more anxious and overwhelmed. So I, for me, the num a number one tool is breath and it's writing. I love Julia Cameron. I love morning pages. I love to write out my feelings. I love to, uh, when it makes no sense, just getting it out on paper. So those are the ways that I defog the window so I can see what the universe has in store for me. It might be different for you. For you, it might be movement. It might be going out and smashing shit. Do whatever you need to do <laughs> uh, to help you see how the universe is working in your favor, because it is. 
Lastly, the thing I want you to take away is to act. If you get a little feeling, our bodies are so knowledgeable. For a while, it was thought that our brain was the bigger brain and the number one thing. It's actually our guts. And there's all this conversation about the vagus nerve. And our bodies are designed to help us to know how to move and how to act. We know when we're safe. We know when we're joyful. We know when we should really go up and talk to that person because something's really encouraging us. Act on it. If you're someone who believes in signs, if every time you see a red hibiscus flower, you're like, ooh, I need to give someone a hug, do it. It doesn't matter what your reason is. Whatever it is, use it as a tool to act. And if there's something throughout your life that's been thematic, for me, the concept of breathing and writing has been thematic. Even as a nine-year-old, as I was experiencing life and all of, all of this, I wrote. As I experienced the trauma, I wrote. And so when my memory's like, I don't know, girl, did you really go through that? I go back and I read my journal entries. And I see that nine-year-old girl struggling to understand herself, struggling to understand her family, struggling to understand shame. And it's been something that's been constant throughout my life. So in your life, there's something you were likely doing at nine or eight or 10, 22, that's been constant throughout. And maybe that is the star that you can begin to piece together and find and say, ooh, okay, this might be my good star and where else can I see it? When I think about it, I always think, what am I doing when I'm suffering? And what am I doing when I'm experiencing joy? And if those two things are the same, I begin to see, oh, okay, this might be connected to my purpose. So find whatever the signs are for you, find whatever the tools are for you, and use them to act, because the universe has an abundance of good, and the universe is look, always looking out for you and for your favor.